I've met widows who are angry at people who died because nobody is having a conversation and, with them, so they are covering their pain. So I talk about my, I, I mean, I've been in places where I was in a, in a smaller setting and I, I had my frustration and my anger when my husband died. I was, I was so angry at, at him for dying. I'm like, it, it felt like he won. He, he, he won in the sense that I'm still struggling, you, you've rested, yeah? It felt like, no, we needed to go through this and face each other and, and figure things out and the children maybe would have still needed you. If I am battered by my husband and I have a platform with a YouTube or even a mainstream, they don't wait for me to heal. They take me in my broken status to fix a broken world. How does that even help me? I was beaten by my husband. I have no place to go. I have no food. And then I come to a show. And I say, look at me, look at poor me, and people give me money. And they raise, you what, that money destroys my life. Because there was a lesson. Like I've said, we have to take responsibility for the things that happen to us that we contribute as grown-ups. If it's a bad marriage, what was your role? So I ask a question. Is it the person who tells their story first or the one who can tell it the best? So my name is Redempta Mwikali and I am a proud storyteller. I'm an author, so if you want more details about the nitty details of my life, I've told the story of my life. And that's what makes me so passionate, even being here today, to talk about the good, the bad and the ugly of storytelling. So I am a passionate storyteller who is volunteering with other people like Moments with Justice to police storytelling in this country because we will not just shape the morality in this country, we will will bring a vibrant nation who knows how to tell good stories. Not downplaying people's pain, but not emphasizing on things that are not helping us. Because I connected with my own story, I am a storyteller who believes stories are very powerful, they can give us therapy, and yet they can also destroy. And I connect with my own story because my story is so personal, but it's not about me. God knows why he even delayed my coming out in terms of storytelling. Because now I'm very sober. Because before I'm like, I'm writing this and this is happening. I'm talking about the good and this bad thing is happening right now. So if I go back now probably to the introduction of why I connect to people's stories, it is something to do with how my life was shattered. And so I, why is it shattered? My marriage has broken. But I don't want to start from a place of brokenness. So let me start from the place of positivity. I met a man and we fell in love. And out of the people I'd interacted with, he was like a star because he came with a lot of authority and confidence in I could be a wife. So I met this man who we, we are working in the AIDS control program. And so we are alive to the fact that people are dying, but people still have to fall in love and date. And we go on a road trip to Kisi and it's World AIDS Day. So ironically, it's World AIDS Day, World AIDS Day when AIDS is a killer, and we are going out and people are still saying, I'll go out with this person, I'll do this. So I get wind that there's this new guy in town and he's going to ask me out. And so it becomes like the, 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 the relationship in the workplace that who is going to, and I even get an older woman to warn me. She said, please watch out. You're a very young woman and you're going to get misused on a road trip and you'll be the talk of, of, of the office on Monday. I'm in my mid-twenties and, and now I'm just about to begin life, like, like the way, this, the, what is it called, the, the perfect home really, like I'm, now I have a job, it's like the milestones, I want to finish school, I don't want to get pregnant when I'm young, so you're, you're going through all these milestones and you're doing, so I'm here and now I want to get married, one because of pressure, societal pressure, but also now I'm not looking too hard. I am a pretty young woman who likes to wear short dresses and I am living the life. I am torn in my faith of the do's and don'ts. So I'm, I'm, I'm now, I'm living life. I'm living life. So I met this man that there's a new guy in town. And in town here yeah, we mean in this department. And he's single and I'm single. So people are speculating like, maybe that is a guy for you. And that's, that became now how I met this man. And so when I'm now talking about the brokenness, 
what do I remember about my marriage? What do I remember about meeting? I remember the first date we went on a lunch date after that road trip. He was a gentleman. He discovered I was, I was not going to be carried in a car on a road trip, stopping in every town from, from Nyanza to, to Nairobi. So I, I still, I followed the older woman's advice. Preser be careful, protect yourself. But when we got to Nairobi, he came at lunchtime and said, I'd like to take you for lunch. And the most memorable thing about that lunch date is we still did the lunch in the Kibanda. But because when we went out as workmates, we, we split bills because we are doing this every day. So I was like, let me not assume this is a date and ask, can I give, can I, I go into my bag and let me pay, say, what kind of guys have you been dating, you know? And then I knew this was dating. So it, it was a whirlpool of romance. And then now the difficulties of now, let's, we got married in a church wedding. It, 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 it was really two families coming together. We did everything that we, but it's also the confidence with which he said, I'm taking you to meet my parents. That made it easy for me to get married. So I get married and now our value system starts to, to, to drift. And I'm a church girl who has fallen, gotten up, fallen, gotten up. Now that I'm married, there's no more falling, but he's not there. He's still a young man with his, his, his early 30s, I'm in my late 20s. So that, that, those differences begin to now tear us apart. And the good, the lively, tall, hand, tall dark and handsome man and manages to buy a car very quickly in our lives. And the one thing I say, I stood my ground as a wife, is I had to be picked and dropped because we have a car. And, and, and those are the sweet memories. And uh, the other day, I went to Afia House for the first time, and it was like, this is where it all began. I, we were civil servants. And I go to Afia House because now I tell bigger stories. It's not just about me. So I'm pursuing this story about a man seeking for justice, and they are journalists at Afia House because they are giving briefings about COVID. And I have to walk through the gates of Afia House again. But very, very, a very beautiful scenery in front of Afia House is what overlooks the park. You, the view of Nairobi. That used to be the parking. That's where you pick a point for wives. Wives used to be picked from there. And these are lucky wives whose husbands had cars. So I was in that chosen few. And you'd find them reading novels, you know, and knitting. But me, I was not that boring. My mommy, I was a young hippie girl. So for me, it was he would walk to where I worked. And he was, to that extent, he was a gentleman. He'd walk and say, Weeks, you know, you'll call me weeks, let's go home. And that allowed me because I'm, I'm a more, more nocturnal, so I, I work better in the evenings. So I know he's coming from a different place, he's going to drive and park. So all that time, but I mean, and the other, and I, I would look at other people's husband, those pick up, and they are a lot, like they're so serious. But as, as we're just young people who have a car, we, we are one of the lucky people. So I, I like to give that as a background of this is the marriage I got into and the conflict that they come to. Why storytelling and why connecting with the other people's story? Because at my lowest moment, from the unlikeliest point, people that I would not expect to connect to my story saved me. And I've, I've seen in this show where I'm a guest and I really I am appreciative of what this show is doing. It's giving people a platform to, to, to reach out. And I've seen one of the stories I saw that I connected with was a mother crying for custody of her children. And it takes me to now connecting with stories. Fast forward years later, I meet a woman who is a foreigner living in Kenya and her marriage has fallen asunder. And she ends up going to jail for disobeying a court order to produce children in court. And it took me to the year 1999 when things fell apart for me. And I was exact in the exact same position that, okay, this fun-loving guy is no longer fun-loving guy. He's just now a difficult guy. I need some peace. And I don't know about other cultures, but in, in, in Kamba, running away from marriage is expected because it's, they have a name for it. It said, it, it's called Wendo. And ironically, Kiswahili Wendo means love. But Wendo in Kikamba is when you get tired, you go. Nikamba in Kiswahili, it's also Wendo. So it's, it's something women go and come back. I, and the Taitas are here when I'm, I'm, a new couple has a child. Sometimes they take the wife back to the mother to nurse them back to. So for me, it was like, okay, maybe now it's time to go for Wendo. That's what I thought. I didn't think this was it. I didn't think things were going to fall apart. 
And on the day I was supposed, I was supposed to leave, I called for reinforcement. I was like, my husband will come from his, 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 his party life. He was a, really a party guy. And I, I will, he will come, and then in the morning we'll sleep away. I will just go on my window with my children. So everything now became like anybody who's ever been in a, in a custody separation nightmare, that was it. And so on this day, I was lucky to be connected to a church. I had a family that, because I'm not from Nairobi, so my family in Nairobi is very small. So I called, I had a landline. There were no mobile phones, and I called the pastor. And I, I used to go to a Baptist church in Langata, where I lived. And I, got, I called the pastor and said, things are falling apart. Because of that relationship of when churches used to do home visits. So my pastor, uh, Reverend George Situma, and there was a missionary pastor in that church, showed up. And they came for, to tackle the crisis. So see how stories connect us. We have two pastors, and my husband has rushed to the police station to report me that I'm planning to steal, and so they come to reinforce the law. But he has the upper hand. So the, the police have been told a, a story of a woman who wants to steal and go. So we have two policemen. We have two pastors. So everything should go right, right? Wrong. <laughs> It doesn't go that way. So we have two pastors and I have my relative who's come to help me through this. And I'm traumatized because I'm also going through abuse. There's, there's, there's alcohol involved, so there's abuse. So I'm traumatized. And my, I'm trying like a mama hen to protect my children from everything that is happening around us. We lived in a, what they call a code desert. You know, it's, there's no exit once you drive into that court with many houses. And we were, we were privileged, pretty privileged, because we had that garbage collection day. So it was a garbage collection day. So we have two policemen, two pastors, maybe two neighbors. There's about eight of us adults. And then we have these two children who are in the center of, of this ugly fight. And I'm, I can't talk because I think I've done the talking. And I got to a place now in, in my relationship, I became passive aggressive. It didn't mean I was the better, uh, whatever, I was just passive aggressive. Because I've tried everything, it's not working, I've played it, I've, so I'm just passive aggressive. So it catches me that even when I'm trying to blind to, to flee and just go on window and get, it's, it's still getting ugly. And now look at all this, it's a sin. Yeah, so uh, as we are doing all this, the children start crying. Because my family is saying, she won't talk, she's traumatized because of what she's going through. So everyone is, everyone is trying to play their part. And all of us, all these adults cannot figure this out. I just want my children. So the police said, here's what we are going to do. We are going to allow you to leave. You're only allowed to take a suitcase. As for the children, that's not our department. Children are given by the children's court. Now the pastors, the pastors just there to, for spiritual, there's nothing they can do. It's the same, the police, when the police is there and it, this is a law and order scenario. So now I'm like, then I can't leave. So it's, it's, now I'm even more confused. Then if I'm not going, what do I need a suitcase for? I don't need a suitcase. I want my children. I want to protect my children. And so he's saying, you're not leaving the children. And he really did love the children. He's saying, you're not leaving the children. Like, how do I, I know you're having relationships. Why do I want to give you, you know, it's, it. So the older one starts crying and automatically, it's the tension. The atmosphere is conflict. So the children start crying. And now the connection of stories. I think I'd seen it at the corner of my eye, those two boys. I'd seen them and it was like, you know, you feel sorry that every Wednesday or whatever day of the week it was, these boys come and go through our garbage bags. And so they are there. And who would have known? Those were the angels who would now share their story. They didn't, they didn't do it in a very nice way. They connected their story to my story. And they walked from where they were, because they were at the far end. Of course, they didn't want to get in trouble when they are going through the the garbage bags, and they walked very close, like, like a few feet. And these boys, like, they, they became brave. And they were speaking in Swahili. Stop it. Wacheni. Mnafanya nini? Amwoni watoto wakilia. So it's like all of us did notice the children crying, but the children noticed the children. Then they told us their story. And they said, Mnataka watoto wakue chokora. Do you want them to become destitute like us? Because this is how we got here. And that broke everyone. And my husband cried. He, he just broke down and, and walked away. And I was in shock that has it just been decided by two little boys that I can have my children? 
So when I'm when I've seen people fighting and it's so dramatic, I know that drama in a very small setting, but I know it wasn't a court system. The police said we can't do, it, do anything about it. But two brave boys connected their pain to the pain of these children. They, they didn't even care about us. They said, shame on all of you. What do you want to do to these children? Mm -hmm. And so that's where for now, moving forward, my whole life becomes about connecting with other people's story. How is that their story related to my story? So that even when I see it being done wrongly, I'm like, no, but if you really are of faith, even if the system is very unfair to you, don't you believe God can use just anyone to see sense, to see fairness? Because it happened to me. So at this particular time when my friend is going through it and she's being denied her children and she's a foreigner, I remember that story. And I'm trying to say, look, don't, don't disobey the court order. Don't be afraid that the kids are with their father. Produce the, the children as. So for me, that then becomes the pattern of my life connecting with other people. That's, that's what makes me an expert of storytelling because I can see the power of, I didn't go for counseling even after that. And that became like a cycle. Every time I'm in a crisis, I connect. And the next connection would be, I have to decide, I work in the government, I don't have enough salary to maintain the lifestyle that I'm used to. And I'm also, at that particular time, I've decided to go back to school. I want to, and I'm thinking I want to study psychology because uh, there's so much about AIDS that is connected with human behavior, understanding human behavior. So I want to go back to school. So I'm told now, what do I do with my desire to help humanity with my brokenness? And that's why I'll, I'll, I'm consistent in why am I a storyteller? Because stories shape us. Stories can destroy us if told or lived wrongly. Because every year of your life, you're telling a story of your life. Yeah, and some, some are just a chapter. I have committed myself to teach people the power of storytelling because it, it shapes the future. It shapes the people who are going through affliction. Because when we tell stories to show off, for example, and people tell, show stories to show off, you're showing you are a happy family and you're spending so much energy shooting, dressing up, photographing. And I'm looking at these families that are doing this and I'm saying, when do you leave? Because you're forever on a set. So that's the, the showing off. It is showing off, I'm, I'm sorry to say. It's not a story. It's reality TV, which is not real. You're showing your story because you have bad days in marriage. You have conflicts in marriage. You have unfaithfulness in marriage. But then you've decided, I'm going to keep telling this happy family story. So that's one extreme of storytelling. And the other extreme then would be then the broken people. There's no problem with using broken people to, to fix a broken, not broken people, brokenness. People who experience brokenness. And I'm hoping by that time they have healed. So I look at my own life and I say, I have a limp. And because I'm a Christian, I relate the story of Jacob who had an encounter with God and walks with a limp. So not having like the ideals, the ideals in family makes me have a limp. But now that was brokenness. So I broke and I healed. And currently, I am sorry to say I am <laughs> I'm going to join forces with people who give me an audience, like even this platform, because this production, for example, is giving me an ex a clean way of let's, let's tell stories. It's getting murky out there. People want followers. People want trending. So what are we doing in telling our stories? When we are not showing off to become influencers, then we are showing our pain. I want this generation. I want... I want Moments with justice, for example, and, and Redemptor, I want to bring the wisdom of my, my experiences and the generation is living in. And let's have a melting pot where we tell stories for prosperity, for where we, the moral, moral decay is not because of the stories we are telling. And uh, there's, there's, um, there's someone who said it in, in the fashion industry, they wish all people who had taste had money and all people who had money had taste. In the storytelling context, I wish all the people who had platforms had decent content. And all the people who have decent content had platforms. Because the people who have the platforms, what are they doing with it? There's a terminology in storytelling. And as, unfortunately, as a storyteller, com, com, compassion about storytelling, I'm looking at all stories of, uh, of pain and, and uh, stories of wellness were told. So wellness stories now are just about materialism. The stories that are making headlines are, look at how beautiful we are. Look at how beautiful our children are. But we live in a broken world. You, we live in a world where adversity has been guaranteed to us. 
that in, in this life you'll have trouble. So what do you do with people who cannot show off and yet they are great families? So I am, my heart aches that there was a terminology coined by when we became aware, when Africans became aware, hey, our stories are being misused when the NGO world came and they started showing pictures of, of poor children, dirty children, malnourished children and fundraise for us. And someone coined up a terminology called poverty porn. And now there's a new one, and it's called prostitution of pain, where if I am battered by my husband and I have a platform with a YouTube or even a mainstream, they don't wait for me to heal. They take me in my broken status to fix a broken world. How does that even help me? So I call it prostituting of pain when you come and talk to me. Can you imagine at that time if my connection was not children who had experienced it? Someone would say, let's take this story to this platform so that your husband can give you your children. I would have used my pain at the expense of what? My children being exposed? Because later they'll come and these, these networks never forget. They come back and say, oh, you said you're a happy family. You say. So I want to impact and I want to have accountability partners with channels that are doing this to come and say, hey, step on this show of stories. Step on too much pain. Let those people go for counseling. And also there's another thing we are doing with our storytelling. We are selling pain, like it's prostitution of pain, that's why it is. For what? I was beaten by my husband, I have no place to go, I have no food, and then I come to a show and I say, look at me, look at poor me, and people give me money. And they raise, do you what? That money destroys my life. Because there was a lesson. Like I've said, we have to take responsibility for the things that happen to us that we contribute. As grown-ups, if it's a bad marriage, what was your role? So I ask a question. Is it the person who tells their story first or the one who can tell it the best? So in stories of, of conflicts, in stories of luck, is this a generation that where we just think about material things? That a good family is the one that has a car that is looking beautiful on Facebook and the one that is not. So it's, it's all about storytelling. I want to hold every storyteller and every story gatherer accountable for knowing when not to tell a story. A story is told, we are living a story, walking, breathing, I walk to the matatu, I got in a matatu, is a daily journey of stories. But are these stories worth being shared at the time? There are stories that belong to a counseling session. There are stories that belong to a confession, that I used to do all these bad things, now I've stopped. That's not a story. Because how sure are we you have stopped? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm just seeing the trends because we are advertising evil. And that's the, the, how our stories now are uh, shaping our lives. And then another story that I am also holding people accountable for is telling stories of prosperity. There's, I don't know if there's any philosophical or, or way of living people embrace that does not have trouble. So and when we rush on and they tell the troubled stories, like in my own story, I could rush here and tell you about how bad my marriage was. But how many women were married who had husbands who dropped, dropped them? And, and my husband was a good provider. So do I come and say, oh, now he's taken everything I want? I, I did, I do, do. I was in feeder. I, I looked for the platforms where I would get help. I ended up in a shelter for battered women because I just needed peace. So can you imagine if it is the day, the present day, where now we first tell your story, then we find you help. Let's find you help and figure, have you figured it out? And when I tell the story and someone is listening to my story, what is the moral of my story? We are so self-absorbed. Stories are supposed to connect us with one another. But now our stories are me, myself, and I. Yeah? And, and that's why for me, I tell you, my first story is I went through adversity. And it was street children, destitute children, who saved me at that particular time. And so moving forward, I had to tell every story about me that is painful, let me look around. Because those boys looked around. They, 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 were, look, they were going through their garbage for maybe the daily bread or to look what they can go and sell to eat for the week. And me, I'm here, luxury. It is luxury. I just want my comfort. I want this to end, but to end amicably. So that is why I'm saying the people who are gathering stories, who are telling stories, are we also telling one-sided stories? Story gatherers are becoming very lazy that I walk up to someone who has a platform and say, I have a story, I'm an author, 
and I want to teach other people. Else. So they are, they are lazy that the person who shows up at their set with a story is the one they, t they take. There is no background check. There is no due diligence of what is the, this person's life about. So, and I am, I am sorry to say, in a lot of ways, women tend to be more em emotional and em expressive so they can express their emotion. And I'll be, I'll say here the risk of, of, of sounding like I don't understand the, the pain of women, but we tend to be the first ones to tell the story. And so a man will be like, ah, my dignity, my pride. The story has been told. And we also tend to be the ones who scream the loudest. So it's, it's the people who are t telling stories of conflicts. Are there untold stories that we are ignoring because they are not going to get ratings? Stories of overcoming. I'm an overcomer. And I want to teach anybody who is mandated telling stories, editing stories, because there's a lot of creativity in telling stories. You get two people who are in a marriage tell their story, and the better storyteller, people believe them. And then we have the people with authority to tell a story. I want to share another story that, that shows you how we are a chapa copy. Chapa copy for the younger people is these shops in town, business centers where people produce a lot of copies. So it's, it's going like this. So we are now a generation where we tell stories like they have no depth, they have no moral. What is the moral of a story? Because why I'm saying stories is once upon a time, and it always has the beginning, it has the middle where the lessons is, and it has an end. So because of our chapa story, our, ch our sto stories tend to either have the beginning and an end, where the end is Give me what I want. I want justice. I want money to start over. I want so what the middle part is the, sto the the stories. So for me, I'll tell you this: in the last twenty years, because I've done this now for twenty years, for me to come completely say I am a storyteller. I tell my own stories, and I'm done with my stories. I want to teach other people how stories can help because I tell my stories in very small circles. I've done prison ministry, and I've connected my story of what happened to me to their stories of the, they were so angry. They were angry because for them it's survival. How can I let another woman take my this? But I knew, I, maybe the way I was raised, I knew you can always start over. Money is not everything. These things, and I, I didn't grow up in luck. So when I f finally had a house with my own mind, my, my own things, out of the things I had actually, my parents had given me a bed and a mattress to start life. And when I was losing everything, I was telling my, my we, we were negotiating. We were, it was not that bad We because there was no, people to, to make it worse for us by telling the story, blowing it up. We had moments of, can we talk about this? What's going to happen? So we have a situation where it's who tells the story, whose story is more sensational. Yeah, that, that, that it's so justice then our ability to shape and reconcile people is taken away. I follow stories for many, many years before I tell them. I have followed stories that I didn't tell because they were not worth telling or they had not resolved themselves. I have people who look at me and think that they think I want to tell their story. I'm like, I'm not even interested in your story. You sort yourself out, when you sort yourself out, but then there's also stories about justice. So I want to address the stories of justice because that's where the, my next chapter in storytelling is going. It's going to be talking about who are we as, as a country, as a continent, who are we as a community. So in telling those stories, I'll give you an example of a, a scenario where I connected with someone's story. I am watching news. And then I see on news, and there's a man who is not from Kenya who has burnt a, a girl. And she's fighting for her life in Kenyatta Hospital. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder what happened here. And again, because I believe in divine connection, I don't believe in, in coincidence. A lot of the stories that I follow, I have watched them on TV sometimes. Or I've, I've encountered people looking who need help. And so I call, two minutes later, someone calls me. Redemptor, did you watch news? I say, yeah. Did you see the guy who is just accused of? Yes. He's actually in our college. So this was a guy who was studying to become a priest. So now the story just got more interesting. Why is a priest accused of trying to kill a, a girl? And now, now that they are foreigner, they are a girl. So I tell this story to talk, show that sometimes we, we show biases because we take aside immediately we hear a story. And I left my comfort zone. And I went to Rongai. Actually agreed with one person. Do you know him personally? No. Let's just go. And we showed up at the police station. And then we had his side of the story. And I said, does anybody else know this story? He said, yes, I'm living here now since left this, the priest journey, vocation journey. And he was now just a, a normal citizen, foreigner. And so she said, there's this girl that I live with. Go and see her. 
and I followed that story for six months. Six months I would ask my, in fact one time I, I went to the police station and he, 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 he talked about me as if I was not in the room, said, who is Redemptor? And I went to him and I said, who is Redemptor? You know, why do I care about this foreigner who could, and sadly the girl died. And when the girl died, now it became a game changer. You will not believe this girl even in her death. When she was told to write, because she couldn't talk, she had, I don't know what percentage of bands. When she was told to write who, who did this to her, she wrote the guy's name. Did that guy ever stand a chance that someone at their death? And I followed that story. And I followed that story enough to con confidently conclude that girl committed suicide. I, I, I mean, I, I did, I, I look at people who have the skills. They went to school and they were taught how to investigate. They were taught about ethics and storytelling. They were taught, mine is, is innate, just common sense of right, wrong, good, bad storytelling. But I was able to investigate this story and also give myself and connect to these people's pain because there were many people involved. There was a girl who was, uh, who was burned. She had a sister who knew this man. There was this girl he was living with. Those are just the few. Now, the, behind all these people, there are other people. And the person who, who held my hand and said, let's go and follow this story, was also studying to be a priest and, and passed on later. And I always remember that he, in his own vocation and, and need for truth. He didn't just want stories. He wanted stories that, that brought out truth. So I f pursued this case with the policeman. I think I did more investigation than the police. <laughs> to the extent one day I went to wear the scene of the crime and I, and I told the person, I didn't lie, I just said, our girl. And I knew by saying our girl, the person giving me the information would, would be biased to let that foreigner rot in hell. They said, ah, she committed suicide. So I've seen a lot of stories right now she, she committed suicide. I, I found out, I even went to where she was being counseled. I begged the counselor. I said, I know you have client uh, privilege, confidentiality clause, but I, the, a man's life is at stake. This man could actually go in jail for a crime he didn't. So I investigated that he had, she had gone for counseling. And who had paid for the counseling? The same man. I spent time with the man. In fact, the person who was the alibi. And if, if someone knows wrong guy, this happened, I think, on Church Road. And the alibi was saying this guy was not even on church road that night. He was in Quarry. So that's quite a long distance. So I went to Quarry. As an investigator who didn't know one day I'll be a professional storyteller. And I said, I found my size. And I said, do you know this story? And people want to be paid to give stories or to tell the truth. But I'm like, no, if this man was here, he was here. It doesn't matter if he's a foreign. It doesn't matter if he's a bad person. And I got those Maasai's took them to the police station to write statement while it was still fresh. And I was working in, in collaboration with the police. I was not doing this. And I even tried to get people from this guy's country to help me. But it wasn't their burden. It was my burden to get to the truth of this. And towards the very end of this, this, uh, this six months, these two, the alibi, the one who had the alibi for this, they had a falling out. And I got a call from the policeman, like uh, the, the OCS. He, I became a partner with the police for this particular story. Because I was like, do they know something that I don't? Because I, I made, I, and I prayed about it. I said, I want to be able to get to the bottom of this. If this man really did this, he should rot in hell. If he didn't do, he has learned his lesson. He, he will, this, this will become a defining story in his life. He has lost everything and someone has died. And I went to the police station the day the, the girl died. And the policeman actually became his friend. Then they had finished with the investigation. I mean, getting investigation, getting stories in Kenya is so easy. I don't understand why people tell one-sided story. Kenyans tell stories. We, and I thank, I'm thankful because, because of that we will never have a genocide. You will be planning to kill another community. And the people will just go and start gumzom tani. And so I was able to gather a story. So when I see people who have the privilege, the, the resources, to do a good story, and they do a shoddy job. They, they miscarry justice. Years later, I, I, I was going through a newspaper, and I saw an article, and the judge was blaming the police for a shoddy job. I'm like, shoddy job? Do you know how many hours we investigated this story? There was no shoddy job. The girl, unfortunately, committed suicide. And because she was involved with him, it was really a murky story. It was just love gone bad. It was just uh, the desperation we have for relationship, the fixation we have with foreigners. That was the story. And the, and the person who passed on, when, when we sat down to analyze, he said, Redemptor, are you sure you want to continue doing this? I have done that with several other stories. 
I've pursued a story of a girl who was depressed, who ended up dying. I have, I have many stories that I've followed that I knew that I was helpless, but I did my part and I connected, I tried to do the connect. So sometimes as a story gatherer, it's not your story to tell. Some of it will not be your story to tell. It will belong to the authority. So it, when it comes to the court of uh, public opinion, for example, on the stories we tell, it's miscarriage of justice when we, we just say, like if this story had been in these days of social media. I, I don't think that guy would have had a chance. It was just the tr either the truth or the sensation. A foreigner kills our girl, I, and it's happening. The, the gender-based violence cases you're seeing, people start talking about it, and we, we are becoming loose talkers. We are talking carelessly. And I'm really passionate, so passionate about this because I want to talk to churches about how they tell testimonies and how that is hurting us. I said the story that involves more than one person has to be shared with caution because you have a right to tell your story. Even if I tell my story, it will affect my children. But it is what it is, you know. So I have to decide to what extent do I share is my truth, my right. Because if, it, if it's my right, but it's going to hurt someone else, then I have to step on it and say, that's, not, that's a story for another day. What about stories that leave no room for reconciliation? Yeah, that we are fighting for custody of children, and because we are done it, my side of the story and his side of the story, then these kids are, are torn. I'm 50% this, I'm 50% him and her, but now I'm caught up in the middle. It's really the Solomonic wisdom of divide the baby. <laughs> like, let's divide the baby. And I... And, and, to be fair, the, the, the terminology for it is social intelligence and emotional intelligence. So when we lack it, then we tell any story. It's my story. I have a right. Yeah, it's the, the problem, in fact, in fact, by coming to this show and, and really a place of honor to be here in the sense that I, I was very, very conscious, like, let's have a conversation. Let me not just tell you my story. Let's have a conversation. Moving forward, can we be accountability partners? Because I tell you, you people stop telling this story. I have told people not to be a YouTube family. And they were, they were, they were fair enough to listen. I say, Ukombele, it's going to be tough. Is this what you want to be your defining, telling your story about how happy you are as a couple? So are we listening when we are being told, don't tell that story now. Let, let, give it time. Don't tell that story now. So there, there are, stories rotate around adversity or prosperity. And so a lot of the stories that are about adversity, which is what people like. People like those stories, so we think sob stories. They are centered around things that happen to us. So there are two ways things happen to us, the ones that were caused and the things that happen. Unfortunately, violations, even to younger children, are caused. But things that happen to us, maybe in midlife, sometimes like decisions that we made. Yeah? So I categorize stories and things that happen to us that are, were beyond our control and things that, were, that happened to us as a result of the choices we made. The difference is really being able to choose that I didn't choose for it to happen, but I have a choice on how this story defines me or moving forward, how does it shape my life. So in terms of telling stories the things that happened to us, there's a lot of unfairness when we tell stories and there are a lot of uh, uh, collateral damage by standards. So part of my story is my marriage. It's a turning point. And it's what I used to teach life lesson. But I'm very conscious to tell my children, even when I was writing the book, a telling story is therapy. So every story you tell and why you pick this story and not this story is part of the process. You are relieving that experience. So these children did not leave that experience. The older child, for example, in my story, remembers. and says, oh, I like that story because she has also read it. And then also things that are happening to them even as teenagers. Like my, my daughter being expelled from school when she was sitting her exam. And I will use that story with her involved, very conscious, because she had gone through a very hard year with medical problems as a teenager. And here we are, and this group of all these girls were in trouble, and she knows what her mother does. So she's like, oh, tell my story. I don't, I don't mind if it's going to help the other person. So we found that group of girls who were having problems, it was about having phones in school and reacting to the authorities. And out of that time, there were girls who were suicidal. So can you imagine why I able to use my... I could have looked at that story and said, my daughter is defiant. But I knew what that girl had gone through. And I knew she missed her father. And all along, all through life, you always think, what if my father was around? So because uh, later on, my, my, my husband passed, then I'm very, very cognizant of the fact that for, for me, it is a memory. And for them, it's wish, wish, wishing. I wish this was the case. 
So as I tell stories, I negotiate with them. And negotiating and talking about it, I also want to gauge where they are at with that story. And so, sometimes things come out of it that I'm like, hmm, this is a pain point. You know, it's still a struggle for them. So sometimes we, it's not, we don't care. We tell stories and we don't care about, we make comments about stories that are trending because some of us influence conversations. We know what's going on. As like, Let's talk about current affairs. And we've become careless. And we've seen people even land in a lot of trouble and a public out, out, outcry about how our story was told because it, it touched on blaming victims. So a lot of times when we tell stories that involve children, they didn't choose. They didn't choose for you to get married and to separate and to do this. They didn't choose. When you tell stories of children who are molested by the people who are supposed to protect them. So I've, because I've been able to balance and learn, I'm not doing a perfect job, of course. But like, hey, unatu, unatu anika, you really, why did you tell that story? But it's also preparing me to tell stories at another level. It's like they are tears. They are personal stories. And then when it stops being so self-absorbed, self because you discover, Allah, I had problems in 20s. That is, there are different kinds of problems. So when you've mastered that stories really good or bad, you can make them make who, define who you are using stories for therapy. So for us, because we didn't go for therapy. We have never gone for therapy as a family. We had to go through a barrier. It came with its pain. Like, why are we doing? We, we had to to think about a, a succession battle. And every story was now therapy. Because it would happen, it would, there will be tears, there will be exchanges, but we, we go through that. So my children are also having their own stories. And now they're like, okay, you tell your stories. So I don't tell my children's stories. But the stories that we share, I ask for permission. I'm sensitive enough to ask for permission. And I come from the background where parents d dictate. So the same thing, when I'm now working on other people's stories and I'm telling people, this is how you tell your story, then I also tell, ask for permission when I feel I'm, have, I've, I'm biased because of this way. And people assume because I went through brokenness in, in a marriage, they assume I'm anti-marriage. I want to use my story to, to strengthen marriages, not and tell people that all these things you're hearing about, uh, starting a channel about me raising daughters, you know, there's a lot of pain in them. There's a lot of things that I wish they were not this way. So I want to use stories for really to build, not to destroy, and not to be glamorous, just to be real, to keep it authentic. There's a lot of, um, there's a price to, price to pay. I've been invited for a, 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 a talk in a, in a TV station, and that person had a brief about my life, things about what happened to me. But I, didn't, I don't want my marriage to be what defines me as a storyteller. I want to be a storyteller that is universal. So this person invites me and they want this particular story about my, my late husband. And I, the, the, it was never aired because I refused. I refused. It wasn't, the timing wasn't right. It was not what, what I wanted. Just to sell books, you want me to tell that story? I have no right to tell that story. He's not here to tell his side of a story. Why do I want to tell that story? So, yeah. And I've actually gone to a place where I know women who are very angry at, they, I've met widows who are angry at people who died because nobody's having a conversation and, with them. So they are covering their pain. So I talk about my, I, I mean, I've been in places where I was in a, in a smaller setting and I, I had my frustration and my anger when my husband died. I was, I was so angry at, at him for dying. I'm like, it, it felt like he won. He, he, he won in the sense that I'm still struggling. You, you've rested, yeah? It felt like, no, we needed to go through this and face each other and, and figure things out and the children maybe would have still needed you. And moving from one generation to another where we didn't have uh, custody, shared custody, to a generation where people are saying, well, it is what it is. M marriages are breaking. How do you have shared custody when you're telling stories? So we have to realize asking for permission when we can. And when we can't, we can repair the damage we do in telling stories. I want to see some of the, the stories that have been very big on media. I want to see those stories 10 years from now. And I want to teach people the per perseverance of following a story. Like I've gone to an interview and it was not aired because my, my, what I want, the sensational part of the story they wanted, I didn't give them. I, I write, I, I write, I'm a full-time writer now. I'm a storyteller who does not just write because I tell stories in very small platforms. Even if I just, I don't blog, I don't, writing is very intense. So because I want to be connected with all my stories, now I've moved from, people know who Redemptor is. So I've, my first book is really about adversity. And that's how I know the power of storytelling because my whole book was reflecting on adversity in my life and how it shaped my life. And today I'm thankful for the pain that I went through. My life has been great. It wasn't easy, but it was great.
because I didn't tell stories that didn't need to. I'm like everyone, one day I'm write, going to write a book. I hear that so many times. I want to write a book. Then you should ask people, what do you want to write? What have been, what is it that you want? So because you went through pain and you overcame, you want to write a book. It's not enough. You have to go through pain, overcome, and then be able to impact people with that story. So I, I look at it that my first book was really just, this is Bradenta, this is my belief system. And even by the end of my book, when I finished the book, I still don't know who I am. I don't know, I don't know in terms of spirituality. Am I, am I even in the in, in right standing with, with God? I'm, I don't care about society, and I'm glad I've, learned, I've lived in There are two things about stories. There are, there are stories that um, I've written. I'm also a poet, so I've written some poems. And, and there's one poem that I say, do not shame my pain. But also there's the, the other extreme of shamelessly sharing stories. So let's, let's ha have a balance that this is pain. Don't shame because I say this happened to me. Don't now say, oh... This is the redemptor who did one, two, three. Don't shame my pain. But also, let me not just look for stories that you excite you people and tell the story. So shamelessly telling stories as opposed to shaming our pain. I don't want to shame anyone when I call out stories that are not well thought out through, that people have not factored all this, this side of the story. And moving forward, the reason why I'm excited that I wrote the first book about adversity, so I introduced some of the stories I've shared on this platform are in the book. There are a lot of other stories that I share privately. My book is called Did I Order This? And it's actually just basically that. And I, I, I have a scripture that talks about the blind man. Was it his fault that he cannot see? And I say it's very symbolic that scripture talks about blindness because it's like Jesus used the blind to show those ones who are sighted. So it, did it happen to him because of his fault? A lot of time when adversity comes to us, people say, why did it happen to you? So I question, I, I interrogate adversity and the role it plays. So the book is called Did I Order This? But it's basically allowing adversity. It's like all the stories we tell, all the stories you'll ever put here, people really have to roll with the punches. Let your story build you, let the adversity. And if you're, if you're blessed to have accepted to, that you belong to God and everything that happens to you is not by chance, the, the more reason why stories will not just have adversity, but they'll have victory. I am a victorious person because now I can help other people because I tell my story. My second story is about the ABCDs of the other woman. They talk about extramarital affairs. And this book, uh, I just was inter interviewed about the other day and people now are connected to the story. So people who knew this part of my story didn't know I could actually even make fun of, of the experiences and be able to think through. And now I'm having people ask me, how do I, what do I do? when my husband has children outside marriage, and I've gone through that so I can share. So I do that so that I get it over with about me and I start tackling. And I'm not belittling the people who are going through this particular, but I'm like, this is me, this is, so that I can go. I want to be able to use storytelling to bring out the best in us. Because like I've said, we've been exploited and then now we're exploiting each other. And, and lastly, because a lot of people want to tell stories, one, that one thing that happened to them. It doesn't have to be something bad. Let that something that happened to you that is, a, is tragic also be that one thing that made you a great human being. Because I believe why I talk about adversity, why I bash prosperity gospel is it eliminates, it's a one-sided story. It just says, you are not supposed to suffer when you're a Christian. And yet in that same book, there's a lot of suffering that is portrayed. Yet all these, the two are supposed to balance each other out so that you're not crushed until there's no you or you're not, again, uh, too, too glorified. I mean, you're not too prosperous. You can't relate with it. There has to be a middle ground. My story is that I started life in Kibera, and I ended up living in Karen. And I would want to maybe make that my, my, my story. Look, I started here and ended up here. But both places had benefit to me. In today, when I'm able to serve humanity, that I can go back to Kibera, and I'm like, I know the struggles of, of the people in Kibera, and I can go... Uh, to the people with the affluent who live in the in the currents and the mudaigas, I say, I know the misery of this place too. And so what, how do you come and respect each other as human beings and build each other up without looking down on each other? So moving forward, I want to tell stories about uh, the, the society. I want to go universal, but I'm not so keen on what's happening in India. Um, I love Africa. I love being an African. I love how stories are powerful. And I want us to to rewrite some of the stories that have been told about us and now have a generation where like, it's good to be dark-skinned. 
and that's become because we are still there we're still having people come on set they are gospel musicians and they are dark and the next time they come they uh, look like th because those are stories that's a story that needs to so i want to look at bigger issues in telling stories can i just do a whole story about people who bleached bleached themselves and what that was coming from and how that has affected them and look at it as a societal problem and tells a story but it, you can just tell a story of one woman but it, it will have a message to so many. And not those fleeting stories that we have very, really like even a feature. Let's do a feature about what are our issues and then what are our joys. And I want to tell people that even in those bad situations, God is good. Yeah, we've, we've had uh, a song that says God is good all the time. So I've written a poem that is God, good God in bad. Can good and God be uttered on the same breath while in a bad place? Can good and God be a whispered prayer. Easy to utter, God is good, through tears of joy. Easy to mutter, God is good, with feelings of gratitude. Faking it, as you say God is good to get through to his heart. Making you feel good for not putting God and bad on the same breath. Can there be good uttered to a silent God? When dreams are shattered, what good is it? To say God is good through tears of pain. Good God through moments of anguish. Good God of hope in hopeless situations. What good is it? Through your tears, oblivious to the fact that your tears also tear at his heart, moving the heart of God with compassion. Your cry so deep you miss out on the gentle voice of the good God saying, I have good plans for you. Feeling so deeply about your unmet needs, failing at seeing his good deeds, past and present. Feeling is Good deeds qualifies him as good, failing as seeing God present and good in every bad place. Good and God muttered on the same breath. Good and God whispered in every prayer. Good God in the bad storm and in the good tranquil times. Petrified as you fell off the cliff and what a good feeling when God caught you. The realization that God was in the storm and had he stopped it, you would never know what a good God is. God who uses the bad to reveal that he is good. Good God in bad.